Uh, the Ronald Reagan Lecture Series is very delighted to have John Lott here tonight. You can read about him in your program. We have information about our topic as well as his background. And I will only add that John Lott exemplifies the type of speaker that we see for the Ronald Reagan Lecture Series. First of all, he's very smart. And by that, I mean he doesn't just get it. He puts the ideas together and explains it in a way so that the rest of us can get it. If you've had a chance to read his bio, you know that he covers many different topics, economic issues, uh, Second Amendment and gun control issues, public safety and public policy, government policy issues. In addition to hearing his insight on the current gun control debate, we look forward to hearing about his new book, At the Brink. We've reprinted the contents of the, uh, the book flap in your program so you can read more about what's in the book. And it's available for sale and autograph after the lecture. John Lott presents facts and figures, information that makes you think. And that's what we're looking for in the lecture series. And we are happy to be able to live stream this uh, video and very happy that C-SPAN is covering it as well. Now, I only met John tonight. But you can pick up a few little things if you look um, ju just on the surface. For one thing I found on his web page, he talks about, I'm amazed how lucky I am that I have a job where I can think about things I want to think about. And I thought, wow, that's a very, um, very humble, humbling in a way. He al I also noted that his book, At the Brink, is dedicated to my mom. So I think that's also very telling. So he is a very down-to-earth man, and he knows where he came from. And we appreciate hearing from him as he tells us what he's been thinking about. I present to you Dr. Lott. Well, I greatly appreciate the chance to be here. Uh, you've had quite a few distinguished speakers in the past recently, so it's, it's nice to, uh, I feel honored to be added to the list. I've uh, been asked to talk about the new book that I have that just came out uh, just within the last two weeks. Uh, it's entitled At the Brink, uh, Will Obama Push Us Over the Edge? And I think, like maybe a lot of Americans, there's a lot of really crucial things that are happening right now. I think, unfortunately, in some areas, uh, the president's policies have permanently damaged the country. Uh, there are other areas where I think we're close, uh, that things uh, can still be fixed and, and disaster can be averted in some areas. But. Uh, I'm going to try to go through a few of the topics that I have, uh, everything from health care to the economy generally to gun control. Uh, I, you know, just on gun control, there's been a lot of things that have been happening over even just the last couple of weeks. I was in uh, Colorado uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's the first time I've kind of heard of a White House getting involved in the passage of uh, state legislation where uh, the big news when I was there was um, apparently Vice President Joe Biden had just been calling up uh, members of the state legislature there, kind of lobbying them, uh, saying that if they voted the right way, the president would help campaign for them this next year, and if they voted the wrong way, uh, they may f end up facing primary opponents. And uh, according to legislators I talked there, it was about uh, seven Democrats who had switched their votes enough to get uh, for gun control bills through the state house. So there's a lot of things that are happening right now. But what I'd like to try to start off with is, uh, is a general issue of uh, health care. Uh, because I think we've had the best health care system in the world. And I'm just going to briefly go through some of the changes that I think are happening and, and what you can expect in the next year or so. Uh, unfortunately, I think this is one area that the president's not going to compromise. and. I think there's a good chance that we'll see the destruction of uh, private health insurance in this country relatively quickly. Uh, among the big changes that we've seen over the last four years is a lot of pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer and Merck, others have cut research staffs by about 50% in many cases. 
Uh, we've seen huge increases since the Obamacare regulations have gone into effect in terms of uh, health insurance premiums. Uh, if you just look at over time here, you can see uh, these are from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, their consumer price index numbers on uh, the price of uh, health care insurance. You can see it was rising up until the end of 2007 and then pretty much falling until the beginning of 2011. And then we've had, over the next uh, 24 months, you've had about a 20% increase in, uh, in the price of health insurance, private health insurance. And that change basically started right when the Obamacare regulations started to go into effect. You started seeing, stop seeing this drop in health insurance premiums and this huge increase. So, uh, I don't know, you know who Donna Brazil is, but she's someone who ran uh, Al Gore's campaign. Uh, she's been very strongly involved in politics. And for anybody who's been following this, her comments this last week were kind of funny because she was, apparently had gotten a big increase in her, in her private insurance premium for health care. And she had called up her provider saying, what's going on? Why did I get this big increase? And, uh, you know, here's the deal with that, and that is, uh, the president basically promised that private health insurance would be able to offer a lot more services and lower their costs. Well, if that was true, we wouldn't have to mandate them to do that. If I could be a consultant and go to a company and say, look, I have a way that you can offer your, cons your customers a lot more different services than they get right now, and it'll save you money, they would pay you for that advice. You wouldn't have to force it on them. And the very fact that so many insurance companies objected to these regulations should tell you whether or not uh, they actually expected to be saving the money or not. Now, what's going to be happening over the next, starting in January of this next year, I think is the real damage that's going to be occurring. And that is, uh, the way the changes are coming about is it'll make it so you can wait until you're sick before you have to buy your health insurance. And then as soon as you're well again, you'll be able to drop it. You can just, you can just imagine how automobile insurance would work if you could wait till you got into a car accident, bought insurance, got your car fixed, and then dropped. It would no longer be insurance in that case. The cost of you buying, quote, insurance in that case would essentially be the cost of you fixing the car. And there's going to be a lot of people who presumably are going to feel that this is somehow gaming the system to only get the health insurance when you actually get sick, and they'll feel bad doing that. But what's going to happen is as more and more other people drop insurance until they get sick, the premiums are going to rise. They're going to have to rise essentially to cover the high cost of just only covering the people who are sick. And as the premiums go up more and more, those other people who may feel it's bad to game the system, more and more of them are going to say, look, we're just essentially being smucks here by going and uh, having the insurance all the time. We're going to do it like everybody else, and eventually the system will collapse. Now, um, the way it was kind of sold as solving that problem was that if you didn't buy insurance, you were supposed to go and pay a fine. The thing is, you're going to save so much money, and this fine really isn't working out the way it was originally promised. So for example, the cheapest insurance that you're going to be able to buy as an individual when these exchanges get started is going to be about $7,100. For a family, as for an individual, for a family of four, the cheapest insurance that the government's going to allow you to buy is going to be t over $20,000. Now you compare it to what the premiums are now for individuals, it's about $5,000 for an individual. That's the average price of private insurance. So you can just see an average of a little bit over $5,000 to over $7,000. And for a family of four, the average right now is a little bit over $14,000. So they'll go from a little bit over $14,000 to $20,000. That's just going to happen with these exchanges when they get set up next year. Now, um, the th so that's the cost of insurance, but you were supposed to pay a fee or fine if you didn't have insurance. Well, for somebody who makes about 50000 that fine would be about 1600 If you make 100000 it would be over $2,000. But the thing is, you really probably won't even have to pay that. 
even though that's already quite a bit less than what the insurance would cost you. And the reason is, is because in the Obamacare bill, it's set up so that the IRS basically will find it impossible to collect the money from anybody. You know, the IRS, it sounds scary that the IRS is in charge of collecting it, but, but what happens is when you read the legislation, all the normal tools that the IRS has to collect, they're explicitly forbidden from using so that they can't go and attach your income. They can't go and attach your assets. All the things, the threats that they would normally have are forbidden to them. The only thing that they can do is if you overpay your taxes, then when you would normally get a refund back, they're allowed to keep your refund. But the, how do you solve that? Everybody who pays income taxes knows how to solve that. You just increase your deductions so you're not overpaying your taxes. And so, really, the trade-off isn't going to be, do I pay this $1,000 fine for a lot of people versus saving $7,000 by not getting the insurance until I have to? It's going to be essentially paying zero fine and then going and, uh, and saving the insurance premium that's there. $7,000 you'd save each year that you're healthy, or $20,000 you save each year that your family's healthy is a lot of money to save. And it's hard to believe that most people would pass up saving $20,000 a year for their family when I'm sure there's lots of other things they could go and spend their money on. But you can only imagine what happens if everybody decides that they want to go and save that $20,000. This program that was being set up as supposedly a way of making sure everybody's going to get insured is going to find very quickly that nobody's going to want to go and have in health insurance at that point. And real problems are going to ensue because relatively quickly then, as soon as people realize that, uh, private health insurance will essentially cease to exist. Now, I just want to give you an idea of what we're giving up, what's being destroyed here. You know, before I mentioned the pharmaceuticals, the fact is, is that with these huge cuts in research staffs, it means that drugs that would have been developed previously aren't going to be developed. That means lives that would have been saved aren't going to be saved. It means that people whose quality of life would have been improved aren't going to be improved. And so that's obviously a big hit to the United States. But the thing you have to realize is that this is going to affect the entire world. The United States, over the last several decades, has been the workhorse, the real innovator when it comes to developing new drugs. And so it's not, it's not the quality of life that's going to be affected in the United States, it's the quality of life in the entire world is going to be affected by these policy changes that we've seen occurring here in the United States. Now, there's been a lot of discussion uh, with the reform of the health care system, saying, well, you know, maybe the United States' health care system really isn't the best. There's been a big mistake in terms of how this has been described. Often the president would say, look at the life expectancy. The United States doesn't have the highest life expectancy, and so he'd take that as an indictment of the quality of our health care system. And that's simply wrong. The reason why that's wrong is that Americans can affect their life expectancy in a lot of ways that has nothing at all to do with the quality of health care. So for example, Americans get into car accidents at high rates. Okay, we're risky drivers. We drive a lot, and we speed, and we do other things that are risky. It's hard to blame that on health care. Look at obesity. Americans have a much higher obesity rate than other people around the world. Now, how can you blame that on the quality of our health care system? Probably the best way of measuring the quality of our health care system is to ask yourself a simple question. If you have to be sick someplace in the world, where would you like to be sick? And I think when you ask it that way, hands down, the United States has been providing the best quality health care. So one way of looking at it is, if you get cancer, what country would you like to get cancer in? And so you can look at the survival rates for people with cancer in different countries. And you can say, I just have some numbers here. I have other numbers in the book and at the break. But you can say, what's the survival rate? So this is a five-year survival rate for people with prostate cancer. In the United States, it's 99.3%. That's pretty high. In Europe, it's 77.5. Skin melanoma cancer, it's 92% in the United States, 86% in Europe. Breast cancer, over, slightly over 90% in the United States, 79% in Europe. And you can go down 
the list here with uh, significant differences in every single category. It's hard to find anything that I just cancer where survival rates are higher in Europe than they are in the United States. Consistently, they're much higher. In the rest of the world, even larger gaps exist there. So um, now, another way of just looking at this, sorry, it's a little bit off the top there, is um, uh, surveys of how happy Americans are. Because there's lots of things you can't just quantify in terms of uh, just survival rates. It's the you know customer service that you received, do people treat you well. And the interesting thing is Americans are extremely happy with the quality of the individual health care that they receive. The surveys that you have seen in the past have shown 90% rates that if you ask an American, are you happy with the quality of health care you receive, 90% of Americans will say yes. The interesting thing is that even the sickest Americans, they're even happier. If you look at things, people who are chronically ill, you'll get like 93, 95% satisfaction rates with their health care. And even more amazing is that the uninsured in the United States are generally very happy with the quality of their health care. They may not be as happy as the insured are, but if you compare it to Canada, for example, or other government systems, the uninsured in the United States are about as happy as those covered by government systems in other countries. You know, the, the problem is, is that people think that if you're uninsured, that's the same thing as not getting health care. And it's simply not. There's so many ways, even before uh, Obamacare is clicking in here, that Amer and these surveys were done before that bill even got passed, where you would find high rates of consumer satisfaction for uninsured Americans for the quality of the health care they receive. Even ill uninsured Americans were even higher in terms of their satisfaction rates. And uh, I just have some numbers here so you can kind of see the breakdowns. But if you look at questions about are you satisfied with the quality of the health care you receive, or how satisfied are you with your ability to get a doctor's appointment when you want one, or how satisfied are you with your ability to see a top quality medical specialist uh, if you ever need one, or how satisfied are you with the ability to get the latest, most sophisticated medical treatments, what you'll find consistently across these is that insured are extremely satisfied, and the uninsured are basically no different than those in Canada in terms of the quality, their own perceptions about the quality of the health care that they receive. And those are some of the things I think we risk losing. Uh, and, you know, there's a reason, because I think part of what's happening, one of the reasons why they're going to destroy uh, the private health insurance with the regulations I was talking about before is to eventually force us on to a single payer type plan like they have in a country like Canada. And so if you look at these surveys, you know, if you made people as happy in the United States as the Canadians are, the uninsured wouldn't benefit because they're just as happy already with the quality of their health care as the Canadians are. But there's a big gap between the insured and the uninsured, or the big gaps between the insured in the United States and those covered in Canada. And that's what would disappear. Now, so I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about health care. But there are other things I think there's still time to kind of keep us from going you know, we're at the brink, but it's time to, still time to keep us from going over the edge. And one of those is on the economy. And uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit hard to see here, but this is just showing the percent growth in jobs during recoveries since 1970. And this is basically looking at the 43 months since uh, the recovery started. Uh, if you look over that period of time, we have can divide recoveries into three categories. One is uh, recoveries after severe recessions. Uh, and this is the growth line here. The average recovery. And this dot, dash line here is the growth rate in jobs after mild recoveries. When you have a severe recovery or recession, when a lot of jobs have been lost, you have a much bigger gain in jobs afterwards. This solid line here is the growth rate in jobs during the Obama recovery. So after severe recessions, the recovery, the growth rate after 43 months is about 12%. In this case, we're about 
So it's about six times more growth. We've had a severe recession. We can argue about whether it's severe as the Carter recession in 1980. In some cases, it's worse. Some cases, it's not worse. But um, uh, if you look at the average growth rate in jobs, which is about 8%, so that's about four times larger, the average recovery, than what we've had here. So a huge difference in terms of how many jobs have been created. But the problem is, even that understates how bad this is. And the reason is, is because you have to kind of look into exactly what jobs we're, we're having being created. And there are a couple of facts I'll just mention here. One is, after, when you have a recession, obviously the number of people who get hired each month falls. But when you have a recovery, it should go up. More people on average should be hired each month. During this recovery, we actually have fewer people hired each month on average than we had during the recession. So it fell during, uh, from, from prior to the recession, went down during the recession, and then it went down even more during the recovery. Well, how can you have any jobs being added when you're hiring fewer people now each month than you had during even the recession? Well, the way to think about it is, you, you think of it as like water level in the pool. You have water coming in and water going out. The water coming in are hires. The water going out are quits, okay? What is the rate that people quit their jobs? And if you look over the course of recessions and recoveries, what usually happens is that during a recession, people don't quit their jobs. And there's an obvious reason why they don't do it, because they're worried that if they quit, they're not going to get another job someplace else. So they hang on to the jobs that they have. But the problem is, is that the longer the recession, the more people are hanging on to jobs just because they have to, not because they're really happy with the jobs. And so after a long recession, you have a lot of kind of pent-up job demand for people to move to other jobs. And so when the recovery starts, usually quit rates go up. And during this recovery, quit rates have gone down. They've gone down even more than they did in the recession. So pre-recession, recession, quit rates fall. Recovery, quit rates fall even more. And so the only reason why we've had a net increase in jobs, despite the fact that fewer people are being hired each month, is because you've had an even bigger drop in this recovery in terms of people being willing to quit their jobs. In some sense, it's telling us that people are still very fearful of the job market out there, maybe even more fearful than they were during the recession, which is telling you a lot. And so they're even less likely to quit, even though we should have expected a big increase in quits when the recovery started. And so the more reason why you can get that water level in the pool up, even though you're adding less water or less hires, is because the number of jobs leaving in terms of quits is even lower uh, than it would normally be. So one measure of just how hard it is to get a job is looking at the number of hires each month compared to the number of people who are unemployed and looking, as well as uh, the number of people who have given up looking for work. And you can see how this ratio has basically gone up and pretty much been stuck since 2009. We haven't really seen kind of the number of jobs out there matching the number of people who are looking for work. Uh, and, and that gives you some idea why this quit rate has, has not gone up, why it stayed so low, because people have some good idea of how hard it is to actually go and find a job. And there's two groups of people that are really being hurt the most. People are over 55. Uh, when they basically lose their job, they're in a lot of trouble trying to find it. And also very young people who are entering the job market to begin with. The people in the middle hang on to the jobs that they have. The new people who are entering in don't have that luxury. They don't have that luxury to hang on to a job because they don't have any job to begin with. They're trying to enter the workforce for the first time after they graduate from college, for example. <coughs> now, I want to show you kind of one way to think about how bad this uh, recovery's been. And I'm going to show you kind of how economic GDP, you know, our income, 
has changed during previous uh, recessions and how a re depression in the 30s and how it looks now. So here, here's what we call kind of the trend line of average rate of growth in the economy during these periods of time, the dotted line. And this solid line is actual GDP growth. So you can see this is the Great Depression. <coughs> From 1929 to 1933, there's a big drop. But then it increased fairly quickly and got back up. It's just we had a very big drop here. But what you'll see is that when we've had other crashes, you know, this is during the 1980s, it falls. But then it very quickly gets back. This is during the 70s, it falls. But it very quickly gets back to the trend line that you have here. This. It's the first time we've ever seen something like this happen. This is our current recovery. You can see it fell, but rather than going back to this normal trend line, the gap is actually getting bigger. The gap, rather than going back, the gap between where we normally would be after any other recovery and where we actually are in terms of income growth is getting larger and larger with each passing month. We've never seen something like that. It wasn't true in the Great Depression. It wasn't true during any of the other recoveries that we've had. It's something you really need to think about, because when they say growth, the growth is so slow that we're falling further and further behind where we would normally be at this point. Now, uh, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is uh, we're in these debates, like the sequester that we just had, and we're going to be getting into the debt ceiling limit later on. And there are a lot of claims that are going to be made that the president says, well, we just can't even cut the growth of spending, because if we do, that's going to hurt economic growth. You know, it's kind of interesting. I mean, you look at the president's statements over time. Uh, we had, in 2008, I know it's hard to believe this now, but if you go back and actually read the uh, presidential debates, uh, with John McCain, over and over again, uh, Obama promised to make government smaller. His campaign speeches did the same thing. He, he promised a net cut in government spending. He said, I have some new proposals, but I'm going to more than offset them by other cuts. And he promised a smaller government than we had right then. Now, when we got to a week or two after the election, now we, he started talking about the big stimulus, but he said it will be for one, maybe two years. Well, we had a 21% increase in government spending during just the first two years of the Obama administration over and above inflation. That dollar increase in spending adjusted for inflation is larger than the increase in spending that we had during World War II, which is pretty phenomenal when you think about how much the country mobilized to go and fight World War II there. This is larger adjusted for inflation. But rather than a stimulus lasting for most a couple years, we're in the fifth year of the Obama administration. And not only can't we cut spending, but we can't even slow the growth in spending, or we're told it's going to have very detrimental effects on the economy. Well, what can we say? Obviously, I just showed you some graphs a minute ago that indicated our own economic growth isn't doing too well. But what can we learn from other countries? Because the president often has made references to other countries. And so what I'm just going to show you here, this is one of the graphs that I have in the book. Um, all these graphs are from uh, at the break. But uh, what you see here is the growth in government spending and employment. Because the president says it's going to create unemployment if we slow the growth of government spending here. And so on one axis, we have kind of the growth in government spending, cumulative growth, kind of one year earlier. And then the next year, what happens to employment? Does that grow? And if you believe the president should be positive, more government spending should be associated with more growth in jobs. In fact, you see the exact opposite. I increase spending one year, and then the next year, employment growth actually falls. The countries that have done well in terms of growth have been the ones that have been relatively stingy in terms of government spending, have kept it under control. Germany, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Hungary, Sweden, those are the countries that have done well. The countries that had the biggest increases in government spending have done very poorly. This is uh, government spending from 2006 to 2009, and the growth in employment from 2007 to 2010. You can also look at it with regard to GDP, income. 
the ones that had the biggest increases in government spending had the worst growth in income. They actually, those are the ones that saw the drop in income. Here's the problem in part, and that is this notion that government spending goes and creates wealth. The most basic problem with that is that you have to realize the money comes from someplace. Okay? If the government spends more money, that means it's taking money from somebody else, either in terms of borrowing or in terms of taxes, or even if it prints up money that lowers the value of the dollars that other people already have. And so what the government's doing is moving money from where you and I would have spent it, the companies that would have gotten those resources and hired those workers, to the places that the government wants it moved. And you look at this, and it doesn't seem to be doing a very good job on that. And you can, there's other measures. Uh, Paul Krugman has a measure. The interesting thing with Krugman is that when he puts together these graphs in the New York Times, he looks from 2009 on. And what he misses is the huge growth in government spending you had from 2007 to 2009. And in fact, some of the countries that had the biggest increases had little adjustments down simply because they had such big increases. And so he ignores the huge increases they already had. You go and actually look at the earlier period of time when these big increases were occurring, you get the same type of perverse relationship uh, that I was just showing a minute ago, that more government spending reduces income, more government spending actually uh, reduces employment. Now, uh, there's been one claim that's out there a lot. It's almost become a, a kind of Bible for the Obama administration. That is this book by uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt about, uh, about saying that financial crises uh, result in uh, uh, slower recoveries later on. And uh, you know, they go and they say, well, you know, it's kind of subjective. Do we go and define a country as having uh, uh, a financial crisis or not? I didn't want to get into the debate about trying to find countries which way they went. I just took their countries, the way they defined them in their book for this current financial crisis, and, and just say, OK, now let's see after their book's published how those countries turned out. And uh, so this is looking at uh, countries with and without financial crisis to see what happened to their employment, their labor markets, after, uh, after the financial crisis. So there's two sets here. This is the dotted line are the countries that they claim, Rogoff and Reinhardt claim, did not face financial crises. And the solid line is the ones that they said did face financial crisis. So if they're right, then the ones with the solid line should have had a big hit, and the ones with the dotted line, they shouldn't have. Okay? I can't see a difference. <coughs> Both of them basically fell the same, and they stayed down together. You know, when you do economics, you want to kind of say, okay, let's test after the period that you've already looked at. Okay, because people can always play with things a little bit before, and it's better to say, what's your prediction given your model? If you look at this, it's pretty hard to go and say that they get their result that ones with financial crises uh, did worse. Now, it's really interesting. This line may be a little bit hard to see right here. But um, uh, it turns out, in fact, all the bad thing for the ones with the financial crises was due to two countries, Ireland and Spain. And if you look at the countries without Ireland and Spain, this is their solid line up here. They did pretty well, despite having a financial crisis. They're basically flat in terms of uh, job growth. Uh, this is Ireland and Spain down here. And you can see uh, this dashed line is for the countries without the financial crisis. So if you just exclude just these two, the rest of all the financial crisis countries are actually doing better than the ones without a financial crisis. And this dotted line here is for the United States. So you can see we've actually done worse than almost all these other financial crises countries right here. So it's kind of hard to say it's just because we've had a financial crisis that we can go and say that the president's policies aren't responsible for it. All right. Well, I wanted to uh, talk about gun control because I think that's another area that uh, 
something can be done. Uh, you know, just to summarize with the economy stuff, what I hope the book does, because is give people answers to the claims that are being made, saying, well, we can't cut spending because if we do, we're going to hurt the economy. In fact, the opposite's true. We're talking about publicly held federal debt that's about $200,000 per family of four. Publicly held federal debt's basically doubled under the Obama administration. We may not be at a crisis right yet, but if the interest rate went from what we're at, historic lows right now, to where it would be uh, under normal circumstances, you'd be talking about almost $500 billion increases in deficits each year. And here's the problem. Four or five years, if we keep on having trillion dollar deficits, things can quickly spin out of control. Because if interest rates go up, and right now they're very low because people don't want to borrow to go and invest, but if interest rates do go up and you have this big increase in the deficit, then the United States is going to be even riskier. People are going to want to charge at higher interest rates. Deficit will go up even more then. What was already a hard situation will, could spin out of control very easily like we've seen happen in Greece and, and other countries. So I want to talk about uh, the impact of Obama's uh, views on guns because I think this is another area where if people are properly educated about what the debate is right now it can make a difference, just like educating people with regard to the deficits that we're facing and you know, the false claims about the, the deficit supposedly helping the economy. Now, I, uh, before I get into this, I uh, just mentioned I knew Obama. We both taught at the University of Chicago Law School at the same time during the late 1990s. First time I met him, uh, we overlapped for like four years. Um, the first time I met him, I introduced myself, and he said, oh, you're the gun guy. And uh, I guess it was already labeled back then. And, um, and I said, yeah, I guess so. And he said uh, he didn't believe people should be able to own guns. And uh, I had known he was helping out with the city of Chicago suit against the gun makers, at least I had heard that. So I said, well, you know, maybe we can get together for lunch sometime and talk about it. But he kind of wrinkled his face, turned his back to me, and walked away. And that was the end of our first conversation. And I have to say, I probably ran into him about 20 other times, but that's pretty much the way all our conversations went. <laughs> I was not thinking I was going to be getting Christmas cards or anything else from him. I was not his favorite guy. And I think part of it is I really got the strong impression when I would run into him that he viewed me as evil because of the gun issue, that he had very strong views on it. I don't know, pull a Rubio here. But, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the, I had, um, uh, you know, I had found something on the gun issue that he disagreed very strongly about, and he viewed me as evil, not just wrong, because, you know, in academia, I was conservative, lots, very easy to disagree with many people that were there, but we enjoyed, with the vast majority of us, the process of talking about these ideas. And I never got the impression that he enjoyed talking to somebody he disagreed with. Well, I think we're in a situation right now where Obama no longer faces the threat of re-election. And his views on, on guns, he's able to go and give much freer reign than he would have had to worry about prior to, uh, prior to the election. And I mentioned uh, the case of Colorado here. Well, I just want to go through a couple things that I think are important in this debate. And this is one of the reasons why I wrote the book, is just to help educate people and give facts on the issues that are going to be coming up in, in Obama's debate on guns. And probably the most popular thing that he has is this uh, expansion of universal background checks. I have to say, uh, if you watched uh, his January 16th presentation in favor of gun control, at least to me, somebody who follows the numbers very closely, one of the things that was amazing was that I, every single number he brought up was wrong. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the ones for the most important one right here. There's other ones that I talk about in the book that are related. And I kind of guessed how he was going to be arguing some of this stuff. But um, I just go through a couple things here. One thing is he says, he said, 
uh, with regard to this claim about 40% of all gun purchases are done without background ch check. He said, but it's hard to enforce the law when as many as 40% of all gun purchases are conducted without a background check. That's not safe. Vice President Biden said virtually the same thing. He says the consensus is about 40% of people who buy guns today do so outside the National Incident Criminal Background Check system. Now, uh, here's the problem with it. There's a survey done during the Clinton administration that claimed that 36% of gun transfers were done without a background check. So the president took this Clinton survey rounded it up from 36 to 40, but the big problem was changing the term transfers to purchases. There's a big difference between saying gun purchases or sales on the one hand and transfers, because the vast majority of these transfers are within family gifts or inheritances. For some reason, I don't think it would have had quite the bite if the president said, look, there are too many parents giving their a gun to their kids for a birthday or an inheritance that's not going through the proper regulations. I don't think that is not as, as scary as just saying 40% of gun sales are going ahead without background checks. And um, so and it's, this survey was done between uh, November uh, 1991 and November and December 94. It only involved 251 individuals who had purchased guns, who so was very small. But the, pr the other problem is most of this survey was done before the Federal Brady Act went in, even into effect. The Federal Brady Act went into effect in February 28, 1994, and this survey is going all the way back to 1991. And uh, uh, you know, there are other problems I could point out with this, but it's, it's just really misleading. So if you only ask the question the way the president has framed it in terms of what percent of gun sales are going through background check, this are not going through, this would say it's about 13.3%. And that's even though most of this period of time was done before you had the Brady Act going into effect. And I would argue even this 13.3% is much too high because gun sales have changed in so many other ways over the last 20 some years. Uh, you know, one of the big changes has been in terms of the number of federally licensed dealers has changed dramatically. And people didn't even know all the time whether they're dealing with a federally licensed dealer. You know, it's not like for a lot of people who, small individuals who would have licenses sell out of a home or out of a gun show, it's not like they have a big sign that would go and say, I'm a federally licensed dealer. I've done surveys of people who are federally licensed dealers at that time, and most of them say that they hardly thought that any of their customers would know whether they were federally licensed dealers or not. And if that's the case, this 13.3% is pretty much meaningless because you're asking people whether they thought they were dealing with a licensed dealer rather than whether they were actually dealing with a licensed dealer or not. So, <clears throat> Uh, already mentioned. You can see for inheritance, for gifts, 93% of gifts were within family, and over 91% of inheritances were within family. So you can just see some of the problems there. Now, here's another claim that's made very frequently that the president made. He said over the last 14 years, that's kept the background checks have kept 1.5 million of the wrong people from getting their hands on a gun. And other times he said 1.7 million. Schumer has made similar types of comments that has blocked 1.7 million prohibited individuals from buying a gun. Well, again, that's wrong. You know, what the correct terminology is, is that there's been 1.7 million initial denials. Saying there's 1.7 million initial denials is a heck of a lot different than saying there's been 1.7 million prohibited individuals that have been prevented from buying a gun. Let me give you an analogy that may make this clear. I don't know if you all remember this, but the late Senator Ted Kennedy ended up getting on the no-fly list five times. <laughs> Apparently, there was somebody else out there with a similar name, doesn't have to be exactly the same, but similar enough that when the senator would try to fly, he would keep on getting flagged, and not he was initially denied being able to go and fly on a plane. He later flew, right? 
But would anybody want to go and say that five times the, the background check system there stopped a terrorist from flying? <laughs> Nobody would say that, right? But that's essentially the way they're counting it. That's essentially an unintentional laugh there. Uh, that's essentially the way they're counting it with regard to these background checks for guns. They're saying if you're initially denied, we're going to count that as um, a prohibited person prevented, whether or not they were actually the bad guy you wanted to have stopped or not, or simply a law-abiding individual who happened to have the same name or a similar name to the person that you were trying to prohibit from buying a gun. And um, when you go through this, basically what you find is that, um, this is discussion with Kennedy, what you find is that uh, it looks like the vast majority of these additional denials, maybe 95%, are, are false positives, are law-abiding citizens who were stopped when they shouldn't have been. Um, there's different stages in ways these are stopped. If you just look at the initial stage, you have about 90, well, 2010, we had about 76,000 initial denials. Cases were dropped in 66,000, or about 94% of those, just at the first initial review. And uh, that was because they didn't meet uh, referral guidelines, were overturned after review by the Brady operations, or after the FBI received additional information. These last two categories are very clearly false positive types of things, and it's possible to not meet the federal guidelines. Also includes people who you thought had committed a crime, that's the reason why you initially denied them. You know, they lied on their form, didn't admit that they had a criminal background, for example, or uh, you know, some other problem, and yet they still tried to buy a gun. And so uh, it could be virtually all of these are individuals who were, uh, who, um, were false positives, and that's the reason why they were dropped. And even after this, even after we have this 94% drop, about 20-some percent of the remaining 6% are clearly false positives by a survey that uh, they did a couple uh, in 2004. If you look at just 2010, 62 cases of these 76,000 were eventually referred for prosecution. 18 of those were declined by the prosecutors to prosecute, so they only prosecuted 44. And they ended up with 13 convictions out of 76,000. So here's, here's the deal that you have there. When you're talking about 1.7 million people being initially denied, a lot of those, it may simply be an inconvenience for them. You know, they're delayed for months, they eventually go and buy a gun, but they'll survive. But when you're dealing with such a large number there, the problem you face is that it may be small, but it's a significant number of people who felt a need to get a gun quickly for self-defense. People were being stalked or threatened. And you delay those individuals for months being able to go and buy a gun. You're talking about a real threat to their safety. And one of the things I try to make clear in At the Brink is that when we talk about these laws, we have to talk about both the costs and benefits. Everybody wants to keep a criminal from getting a gun. What we have to compare here is how many criminals we're stopping. Doesn't look like very many. And how many law-abiding citizens who should be able to get a gun because they have a name that's similar to somebody that we want to stop are being wrongly prevented from buying a gun. And even if it's a small percentage of this 1.7 million, that's a lot of people who are being harmed by not being able to get it. And the problem is, this isn't the only problem. There's a number that's about five to seven times larger than this 1.7 million of people who are merely delayed, not in this initial denial category, which can take months. And they're delayed up to about three days, almost all of them. And the problem is, is that even delayed three days for a small number of people, I'm not going to say it's large, it also can affect their safety. So if a woman's being stalked or threatened, she may not have the luxury of even waiting four or five days to go and get a gun. And my research shows that you find a small but statistically significant increase in both rapes and aggravated assaults against women when you have even that short delay, let alone the month's delay, that you can have for these initial denials. And that's the net effect of this delay. You can say there are benefits from waiting periods, sure. There can be a cooling off effect. 
But the net effect is to actually make people less safe. Now, um, there are other issues I can get into here. Uh, just, uh, I think we got the wrong file here. But the, um, uh, one of the key things that we have is in this debate uh, that's been kind of ripping everybody's heart out has been these multiple victim or these mass shootings that we've been having. And uh, people talk about all sorts of different rules and laws they want to have to go and try to solve this problem. I think one thing has been left out of much of the discussion, and that is looking what's been a common characteristic of virtually all these attacks, and that they keep on occurring where guns are banned. You know, I'll give you an example from just last summer, which is typical, but I think it shows this pretty clearly. You may remember the Batman movie theater shooting from last July 20th. Well, the thing is, in Aurora, Colorado, the thing is, there were seven movie theaters within a 20-minute drive of the killer's apartment there that were showing the premiere of the Batman movie. Um, only one of those seven movie theaters had a, a sign banning permanent concealed handguns. The killer didn't go to the movie theater that was closest to his apartment. There was one that was going 1.2 miles away. He didn't go to the movie theater that advertised prominently that it had uh, the largest auditorium in the state of Colorado. You would think somebody who wants to kill a lot of people would want to go to the largest auditorium on a movie premiere night. There are going to be the most possible victims there for him to go and attack. But he didn't go there. Instead, he went to another movie theater that was almost the same distance from his home as that one, that was the one place that had these signs banning permitted concealed handguns. He appeared to want to go to a place where the victims weren't able to defend themselves. Now, if it was one time or two, you could understand it. But if you look at least since 1950, with two exceptions, all these multiple victim public shootings in the United States have taken place where guns are banned. And at some point, you would think the news media, when it covers these things, would go and say, you know, they go through all sorts of other details. They would go and mention from time to time, look what's happening here. We've had another shooting in places where guns are banned. I think it would have a huge impact on this debate. You know, this isn't the only type of gun-free zone. They take place in other ways. And one of the things I talked about at the brain has been, you know, people make comparisons, you know, D.C., Chicago, where we banned guns. Those were gun-free zones for a while. Other countries have banned guns. I can't find one place in the world that's banned guns that's seen murder rates fall. I mean, I think a lot of Americans are familiar with the huge increases in murders and violent crime that occurred in Washington, D.C., and Chicago. Usually, gun control proponents would say, well, those weren't fair tests. Because unless you ban guns every place, you know, unless you ban them in Virginia and Maryland or the rest of Illinois, in Chicago's case, or Indiana or Michigan, criminals will go and get guns from those places. So you really need to have them banned every place. The problem is that really doesn't explain it because criminals could go and get guns from those other places to begin with. It may explain why murder rates didn't fall by a lot, but if they're right, you'd expect it to at least fall a little bit, but it surely doesn't explain the increase. Also, as I point out, you can look at other countries around the world. Island nations, they have no neighbor that they can go and blame. Okay, easily, readily defendable borders, and yet you still see the same increases in murder rates and violent crimes after guns are banned there, even when the whole island nation has a ban there. And finally, I would say, if they really thought that this was going to be the case, that murder rates would go up in Chicago and D.C. after the ban, it would have been nice if they had kind of told people beforehand. But in fact, they made predictions that murder rates and violent crime rates were going to fall. And the opposite happens, and it happens time after time. And at some point, I would think people would say, look, it can be random a couple times. If it's completely random, half the time it may fall, half the time it may go up. But the fact that you consistently see these increases afterwards uh, just isn't consistent with that. And I'll mention a couple other things briefly. That is, you know, Australia is often mentioned as an example. I'll just talk about this a little bit here. And that is, 
They had a big gun buyback in uh, 1997. The number of guns in the country went from about 3.2 million to about 2.2 million. What's usually not talked about is the big increase in gun sales afterwards. Gun ownership now is almost exactly back to where it was prior to the buyback. Grown much faster than inflation. So here's the deal. If you look at murders, murders in Australia were basically flat for the seven years after the buyback went into effect. If they're right, what should we have seen? It should have fallen and then gone back up. Instead, it's basically flat for about seven years, and then it goes down a tiny bit. If you look at gun suicides, it's true gun suicides were falling after the buyback, but non-gun suicides fell by virtually the exact same amount. And if they're right, if this gun buyback stopped suicides in Australia, what should you have seen? It should have fallen, and then it should have gone back up rather than both non-gun and gun suicides falling by identical amounts over the same time. Doesn't fit, in any case, the type of story that they want to go and make. If, it, if gun ownership fell and stayed down, maybe we can have some type of discussion there on that, but the facts are just not consistent. So here's the bottom line I would make about guns, and I think it's important for a lot of the debates that we have right now. There are two groups of people that I think benefit the most from owning guns. People who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly, and the people in our country who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, and those overwhelmingly tend to be poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. It'd be great if the police were there all the time to protect people, but they're not. And the people who need to protect themselves the most are the ones who face the most danger, who are most likely to be victims of violent crime. And if you see the types of gun control laws that the president was lobbying for in Colorado or other places, one thing that becomes clear is they're trying to make it costly for poor people to buy guns. You know, if you live in D.C., it's over $500, excluding the price of getting a gun, to go through, according to the Washington Post, to go through the licensing fees and other things that are there. Who do you think that $500 keeps from buying a gun for their protection? Or poor people, right? And in D.C., it's basically poor blacks. And the same thing in Chicago. And the problem is, when you look at Colorado, they want to have a fee for people buying a gun there. The Republicans put up an, two amendments. One was to put a cap on fees. Democrats voted that down. And also to allow people below the poverty level to be exempted from, from paying the fee. You would think, given how Democrats talk all the time about trying to help poor people, they would jump on that notion of exempting people below the poverty level from having to pay, essentially, a tax to buy guns. But they voted unanimously against that. Or almost, I think there are two Democrats who voted the other way on that. And why, then, would they want to impose a fee on buying a gun on people below the poverty level there? I think it's pretty clear. They want to make sure that these poor individuals are not able to go and buy guns. They're the ones who are mainly affected by these types of taxes. And you see these licensing fees and other things around the country. They've consistently refused to exempt poor people. Maryland, the licensing arrangements that they're about ready to pass there will be huge. You know, not just a fee that you have to pay, but a 16-hour licensing requirement, you know, training. That's going to be very costly. It's hundreds of dollars. They're going to have one training facility in, or one place to go and file for the license in Pikesburg, Maryland, according to the Senate bill, the way it reads. People may have to travel three or four hours to get there. Who is that putting the biggest burden on? If you just want to make sure that white, wealthy males are the ones who are going to be able to go and buy guns, then these Democratic proposals are fine. But if you're actually concerned that minorities in high crime areas are the ones that need protection the most, these bills are going to be endangering their lives and their safety. I realize that may not be true for most people in the room fitting into that category, but if you care about violent crime, and I think everybody does, these are the people we need to be concerned about, and these are the people that are being harmed right now by this big national push for a lot of these gun control bills. And it's one of the things I hope becomes clear when people read at the book. They'll provide them with information for uh, being able to argue on these points. 
But I really appreciate your time. As I say, I think there's some places where we're, damage has been done permanently. I think there are other places where things can be fixed. And hopefully the book will provide people with the information that they need in order to try to fix these other issues. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Please come over here to line up. Uh, the cameras would like to be able to get you as well, and the microphone. Come on over here, single row, and if you could ask a single question, thank you. Um, Dr. Lott, thanks for your data-driven uh, analysis. Very uh, helpful. Um, I was curious if you had any comments about some of the procedural techniques some of the gun control folks are talking about, um, specifically um, psychological issues, and, and uh, wonder how that kind of data gets into the database that uh, is going to prevent a purchase of a gun. And right. Also, um, the other one I think is fingerprints. So somebody has to go down to their local police department, presumably, to get their fingerprints taken. Somebody needs to be available to do that before they buy a gun. Another way that they're going to be blocked from making that purchase. Right. Well, I mean, I think the main one, uh, or really the only one with the federal discussion is going to be people with regard to mental issues being denied. And uh, look, again, there are costs and benefits. And that's what I hope is talked about in these types of laws. We're passing laws only mentioning the possible benefits and not mentioning, mentioning the cost. The benefits, obviously, is somebody who has mental issues can represent a danger to people. But even somebody like Senator Chuck Schumer has implied that we're talking about a tiny percent, maybe less than a percent of people who may be listed as having these mental issues actually representing a danger to themselves or others. But it's more than that. When you go and add millions of names into these federal databases here, you're going to create more false positives. So the question you have to ask yourself, we already see how many false positives we have in this case. So we have to say, how many people are we going to be stopping who do bad things versus how many law-abiding citizens who may need to get a gun quickly for defense are also going to be stopped. And as far as I can tell, there's no discussion there that is occurring. No one who's trying to pass any of these bills has any research or discussion about what the trade-off is going to be there. If you throw in those millions of names in there, people who now don't get false positives are going to end up finding that there's somebody now in the forbidden list who may have a name like theirs, and they're going to find that they now, when they may need to get a gun quickly for protection, are going to be stopped. Here's the bottom line. We know background checks can be done much more effectively. Private companies, if a private company had the error rate or the failure rate that the federal government has on these things, they'd be sued out of business. So if you really want to go and try to stop these people without creating this collateral harm with people stopping that you don't want to have stopped, maybe part of the discussion, maybe a much easier way, chance of getting some of these bills passed if they really try to go and fix the system. The problem is, as we saw today in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and at other times, amendments that might try to fix those problems are consistently voted down. Uh, it doesn't seem like they want to go and try to fix those problems that are there. They just want to go, Democrats often just want to go and add more names in the system with the resulting uh, denials of law-abiding citizens being able to go and buy guns. You know, the fingerprints, something that some states have been talking about there, uh, that's going to be more fees. And again, you know, this is an issue of who are you going to be stopping from going and buying guns by making it more difficult. And I'm concerned that unless you go and have exemptions for poor individuals that are there, you're going to make it so the most vulnerable people in our society, the people who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, are going to be the ones who are going to be really harmed by these rules that are being sold as a way to go and protect people. Thank you very much um, for both topics tonight. And I'm seeing a common theme where the government gets involved. There's data manipulation to fit a larger meta-narrative, and the poor get poorer, the sick get sicker, et cetera. But my question is much more basic on either 
guns as goods and services or what is inherently different in, about healthcare, education, or transportation goods and services that as opposed to pie baking or widget making or flat screen TV construction that the laws of economics are suspended and a government intervention to begin with is going to give a different outcome. Well, I'm an economist and I don't think the laws of economics are suspended for any of those things. You know, if you make something more costly, people are going to buy less of it. Uh, if you put regulations on things and, and reduce the return for doctors being doctors, you're going to have fewer doctors. Reduce the number of doctors and hospitals out there, what you're going to have happen is that the cost of medical care is going to go up. You know, anytime you reduce the supply, costs, you know, the price is going to rise. And I think this is things we're going to be seeing more and more of in the coming years as the changes work their way through the system that are there. You know, a lot of doctors aren't going to like, you know, the lower pay that they're going to be getting for dealing with government patients. Uh, they're not going to like somebody else making decisions for them. You know, they went in here as a professional. They didn't go in here as somebody that was just going to follow edicts and rules that other people were going to be giving them there. And I think all these things, you know, a lot of people seem to think uh, they're smarter than everybody else that's there. And surely people in government often seem to think that that's the case. But you look at some of the things like um, uh, Larry Summers, who was uh, Obama's uh, chief economic advisor, you know, he'd go and talk about too many tonsillectomies or too many uh, hysterectomies that are done, and he would say he would look at merely life expectancy results from the sur from the surgeries. The problem is that's not the only reason why people get surgeries. The main reason, for example, that they get surgeries, those two types of surgeries, because of chronic pain. Well. Why is it the government's decision to determine whether or not to value getting rid of chronic pain or not? I mean, that seems like a pretty important quality of life type issue. I may live as long as somebody else, but if I'm in chronic pain, I may not have a very good quality of life. And it seems like individuals are probably better at judging whether they're in chronic pain than somebody else who's merely going to be looking at the one dimension that they think is important there. And so one of the things you learn in economics is that customers usually have better information on what they want than some government bureaucrat's going to have. So there are many different issues that are here that kind of short circuit the normal benefits that we get from markets that uh, aren't going to be taken into account by some bureaucrat whose salary doesn't even vary on the basis of whether or not he guesses correctly what types of things the patients value or not. If I'm a, a doctor and I don't do a good job, I'm going to lose patients or if I'm a hospital like that. But uh, those aren't going to be the types of uh, constraints that uh, government bureaucrats are going to feel as directly on their behavior. Dr. Lund, thank you very much for your help and for your talk tonight. What I can't understand is all of this talk in Bravo Sierra about protecting the children in schools. Well, Israel had this problem back, back in the 70s, and they solved it. There has not been a problem with children in Israel being hurt, like it was up here at Sandy Hook. Right. And why on earth we don't use, uh, why we are not, why we just don't utilize the experience that they have. A few states do that. Another thing that I wish to ask about is these people that talk about banishing the Bushmaster rifle. Well, if somebody stole a stole a stole a Shirley Impala and deliberately drove it up on the sidewalk, killing fifteen or twenty people, they would not say nobody gets to own a Chevrolet Impala. <laughs> no, I mean you bring up two important issues issues that I talk about in my book at the brink. And um, look, uh, Israel, not just in the 70s, but from even before the country was started, had a real terrorism problem. And uh, a couple of things, and I've done a lot of work on this, and I talk about this in, at the brink, 
Um, if you look at the terrorism attacks in Israel during the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the early 70s, virtually all of them involved machine guns. After the early 70s, they almost all involved bombs. And there was no technological change that occurred there in terms of making bombs. What happened was Israel eventually learned that they couldn't stop terrorist attacks by simply putting more police or more military on the street. Here's basically the thought process that went on. Let's say you have a terrorist on a bus, and you have two police officers. What, what are the, this terrorist has huge strategic advantages. There's at least a couple things that he can do. The first thing he can do is he can just be patient and wait until the police leave, and then kill the people on the bus. Or he can kill the police first, and then try to kill the people on the bus. And what Israel found is they just didn't have infinite money. They could flood after attacks. They'd flood, hire more police, more military on the street. But they realized that if the terrorist was just patient enough, there'd be some opening that would allow them to engage in the attack. The difference with allowing people, Israelis, to carry concealed handguns, and you've had up to 15% of the adult Jewish population being able to carry concealed handguns, if the terrorist is on the bus, he doesn't know who he's supposed to kill first. There could be somebody on his left or right or behind him or in front who may be able to stop him. And so that makes it very difficult. So if he pulls out a gun, other people pull out a gun, he's in trouble. And so they switch to bombs because that really doesn't give a chance for others to respond. But you have to realize something. They had a choice of using bombs or machine guns beforehand. When they had the choice, they chose machine guns. They seemed to prefer that. In fact, there's evidence that Bill Landis, the University of Chicago, and I have found that when they moved to bombs, you had less fatalities per terrorist attack. And uh, the point is, is that uh, uh, you know, they had a choice. When they were forced to make the change, they switched to using bombs. Now, uh, the benefits have been not just for people on the street. It's been, as the questioner just raised, for schools and other places that are there. You know, one thing that most people don't realize is that prior to the Federal Safe School Zone Act, in the end of 1995, states with concealed carry laws allowed people to carry permanent concealed handguns on school property. Connecticut was, in fact, such a state. If this attack had occurred back before 95, there's a good chance that somebody might have been there that was permitted to carry a concealed handgun. The, you may notice these kind of modern school attacks that we've been having started after the 95 Gun-Free School Zone Act, the uh, pro-Mississippi attack in 1997. And in fact, the interesting thing about that case is the person who stopped the killer there, in which two people were killed, was a former Marine. The guy's name was Joel Myrick. Apparently, he had a concealed handgun permit and would carry it on school property up until the time of the Federal Safe School Zone Act. Being a good law-abiding citizen, he would no longer take his permanent concealed handgun on his school property. He would lock it in his car, park it a quarter of a mile off his school property in order to obey the 1,000-foot rule. When the attack happened that day, he literally had to run a, a, a half mile to go and get his gun and a half mile back. And he was still able to stop the attacker about 11 and a half minutes before the police arrived. The attacker was in the process of leaving the high school to go to the middle school across the street where he was going to continue his attack there at that time. But Myrick was able to stop him without even having to fire a shot. Now, I know there are other cases, many other cases we could talk about where citizens have stopped these types of attacks. And I've gone through many of them in my books. But uh, you know, the key thing here is that these guys, these killers, are not just going around randomly. Uh, you know, uh, when the Aurora, Colorado shooting came up, people often point to the Columbine case. As always, they miss out some important things there. You may not realize this, but even the New York Times mentioned that Dylan Klebold, one of the two killers there, was very upset about the concealed handgun law that was being considered before the Colorado State Legislature at the time. Uh, Doug Dean, who was a former uh, uh, majority leader in the Colorado State House at the time of the Columbine attack, told me that 
Klebold had written a state legislator opposing the concealed handgun bill, apparently upset about the provision that would have allowed um, uh, concealed handguns permitted on school property. One of the amazing things here is the day of the Columbine attack was the same day that Colorado was scheduled for final passage of its concealed carry law. Just hours before the state legislature was going to vote, the combine attack occurred there. I could go through lots of other cases, but you know, around it's just not in the United States. In Europe, they, all the multiple victim public shootings in Europe, even in Switzerland, where they allow concealed carry in many places much easier than most of the United States, the attacks there have all occurred, the multiple victim public shootings, in the very few places where guns are banned. These killers seem to sort, seek out places where the victims can't defend themselves. And the way to think about this is that these guys are committing suicide, these killers. You read their statements, you look at the videotapes or other things that they leave, they want to commit suicide, but they want to do so because they, they want to do so in a way that people will know who they are. And the chilling thing when you read their statements is that they say explicitly, if I can only kill more people than such and such attack did, even this Newtown attack, the killer was apparently comparing himself to the Norwegian killer. And apparently the reason why he picked the school with these young kids is that he thought he could kill a lot of people without being stopped. And so they think they can get more media coverage by going and uh, uh, killing more people, and they're right. But nobody's out here going and saying we should get rid of the First Amendment or ban media outlets from going and doing news coverage of uh, these killers or being forbidden from mentioning their names. But you know, within hours after these attacks, people well, instead, even though I believe very strongly that would stop or take away the benefits from these killings, but instead, people instantly start talking about gun control restrictions that would have nothing to do with these attacks, but would actually make it so that vulnerable citizens there would be less able to go and defend themselves otherwise. Thank you for your time tonight, sir. Sure. Um, very brief two-part question. One is that uh, multiple states since Sandy Hook have introduced legislation to prevent state and local authorities from enforcing federal gun control laws should those pass. My two-part question is, one, do you think that those laws have any bearing under federal weight? And two, as an economist, do you think that money will follow the freedom principles in those states to attract people who value that protection? Well, I mean, just as the first point, it's a legal issue, it's not an econ issue. But the law, I think, is pretty clear. Uh, the federal government can't force local police or sheriffs to go and do something. So the state, local officials can say, our police enforce certain laws or not. Now, the federal government can send in federal agents into those areas, and those federal agents can go and enforce those laws. So I mean, it doesn't mean the laws won't be enforced. They may not be as enforced as much. But it's not going to stop them from enforcing new federal laws in those areas. And as to the other, I don't know how significant or important this, the point you're bringing up for where people are going to move. I mean, I'm sure it's part of many issues, I, I couldn't tell you. Thank you very much for your uh, time tonight. Uh, I was wondering if you could touch on the, there's a lot of misinformation out there about the military style semi-automatic weapons uh, that are often discussed as, as subject to being banned. Right. And uh, if you could address the, the functional differences or similarities to what are called legitimate sporting right. uh, weapons. Or, uh, yeah, I weapons. guess one of the other questioners asked a two-part question. I only got to the first part of his question. He asked, also asked something that was similar to yours. And that is, look, uh, this whole term of assault weapons is pretty much a made-up term. If there are three different types of guns. There's machine guns or automatic. One pull the trigger, lots of bullets come out. Semi-automatic, one pull the trigger, one bullet comes out, reloads itself. One pull the trigger, one bullet comes out. And then there's manually loaded, you know, bolt action rifles or something like that. And uh, 
Military weapons are machine guns, like an M16 has a machine gun mode. They can one pull the trigger, several bullets can come out at once. Now, the thing is, uh, it makes no sense to ban guns on the basis of the way they look. AR-15 looks like an M16, but no military around the world would go and use an AR-15 because its guts, the way it functions, is exactly the same as the sporting rifles or hunting rifles that you're talking about. And they fire the same bullets with the same rapidity, doing the same damage. So here's my point. If you want to go and ban semi-automatic guns, then ban all of them. Don't just ban the ones that look a particular way. And I think that's the problem with Senator Feinstein is having with her bill. I mean, we've tried this before. Lots of academics have looked at the data in the United States even studies funded by the Clinton administration, and they didn't find any benefits in terms of crime rates. It's not surprising. You know, it didn't change. The only guns that were banned were the ones that looked a particular way as opposed to how they function. And uh, that also, the assault weapons banned before covered magazine sizes, and that also didn't seem to make any difference. So, um, but I don't think the president wants to go and try to argue for banning all semi-automatic guns. He wants to go and just you know, what he calls military weapons, which is incorrect, again. And, uh, you know, the reason why he doesn't is because most guns owned in the United States we could classify as semi-automatic weapons. And people know the benefits. You know, if you had a bolt action where you had to keep on pulling it back and loading it yourself, you're not going to be able to fire very quickly. I found uh, seven cases in December without even trying where at least 10 shots were fired by victims to defend themselves in an attack. And that's because you'd have three or four burglars break in simultaneously into their home. So I don't think the president wants to make that claim. Instead, they go after just a small group of weapons based on how they look. And I think they're going to have a hard time making that safe. Now, at state level, uh, you know, it's a different story on what they can get past. Thank you so much, sure. Dr. Lott. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. We are going to uh, hold a drawing. If you did buy a book already, we can possibly arrange to refund your, your money on that. But if you have a card and want to uh, fill that out real quickly, Dan will collect that. Meanwhile, um, Dr. Lott, I would like to present you. I know you deal with many weighty issues over the uh, time of your research and your work, and I have a jar of Reagan's favorite jelly beans. I'm sure my daughter will appreciate it. Thank you very much. That's right. Well, uh, thank you so much.